Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our esteemed guest to the stage. They are renowned expert, another five year of Modi Sarkar election in India 2024. Without further ado, let's give him, give him a warm welcome to Siddhant, the Fire India and the USA with Najum Sethi. Now, next to over you. Thank you for this. Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. At the back? Okay. <clears throat> I would have liked to have spoken in Urdu, but um, the lady on my left, on my right, um, for her sake, I think we'll have to talk in English. Um, Siddharth, of course. Uh, can talk in several languages, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. Um, so let's start. Um, I don't really need to introduce uh, the two speakers to you, except to say that um, one is a, a journalist of immense credibility and repute, and the other is a highly acclaimed author. Both are well versed with what is happening in India, written about it all the time, and are acute observers of what's been happening um, in India, especially in the last 10 years since Narendra Modi came to power. Um, so I think I'm not going to be talking too much. I'm going to let these two talk. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions and then uh, open it to the house. And then you gentlemen and ladies can ask them some questions. So my first question is to Siddharth. But before I do that, I just want to say one thing. Um, it's very difficult for us to travel to India and for Indians to travel to Pakistan. Uh, and this is especially true since the Modi regime came to office. Um, for 40 years, I used to get a multiple entry visa to go to India. Uh, and But for the last five years, I have not. I've been denied a visa to go to India. Um, and so that reflects on the situation vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan and India and people-to-people -people contacts and journalists visiting each other's country. But it's an enormous pleasure that uh, uh, Siddharth has been able to make it here. I still think many more people come from India to Pakistan because ours is a slightly more relaxed regime. But uh, the regime in India is extremely uh, hard on people from Pakistan coming to, to India. Um, I don't know why that is so, but that is certainly the case now. Um, and so therefore, it's, it's a double pleasure uh, to, to welcome Siddharth here. Um, I also want to mention that uh, he is not uh, amongst Narendra Modi's favorite journalists. And um, he has paid the price uh, for his independence and for his free thought. Having said that, um, my first question is to Siddharth. Um, we're looking at, are we looking at another at least five years of Narendra Modi? Or do you think uh, the Congress or, or the other parties will give him a good run for his money? I'll be very frank uh, and uh, honest with, with you, Najam, and uh, with, with everybody here. Uh, and I'm saying to you what I say uh, in similar meetings in India, and whenever I'm asked this question, even in social gatherings by people who somehow think that journalists are clairvoyants of some kind. We have uh, some wisdom that the public at large doesn't have. And my view is that the election is actually open. Uh, the, there, is, there is a fight on the cards. And yes, the ruling party and the incumbent prime minister have the advantage of incumbency uh, because a lot of uh, the sort of election process, and I'm talking about mobilizing money, uh, being able to make announcements, being able to, to bend the rules of what you can say and what you can't say, what you can do and what you can't do in the run up to an election with public money, tends to work in favor of those who are in power. 
So there is an advantage that Mr. Modi has and that the ruling Bharati Janata Party has by virtue of this and uh, by virtue of the fact that, that for the last, uh, what we've seen over the last 10 years is that uh, many institutions that uh, are supposed to function independently of the executive uh, do not behave in that fashion. And this also confers an advantage on, on the ruling party. But today you have a situation where I think you have public disaffection. You have the opposition realizing that uh, the mood of the public has shifted. More importantly, you have the opposition realizing that if they don't get their act together and fight in some semblance of a united coalition, then it will be much easier for Mr. Modi to win and for Mr. Modi to then finish them off uh, politically once and for all. So there is a, a sense in which many of the opposition parties see this as an existential election. You have a number of leaders against whom cases of one kind or the other have been filed. So you have the, the use of the investigating, you know, investigative machinery being deployed against opposition leaders. And there is a sense that, look, now is the time where we have to stand together and, and fight this out. And, uh, you know, the, ever since they announced the India coalition, one has definitely seen the kind of impact it's had on Mr. Modi and the BJP. It's still an uphill battle because the advantage, Najib, you have to remember that in a Lok Sabha of 543 seats, the Bharti Janta Party alone won, I think, 303 in 2019. Uh, that's 30 more than the halfway mark. And uh, in many states where they did very well, like in Delhi or in Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, the BJP won more than 50% of the popular vote. So uh, uh, it's not going to be easy, but I think there is a fight on the cards. And uh, we, we see this reflected in, in the way in which the government is uh, resorting to other means. There's a much more pronounced emphasis on Hindutva as a way of confusing the electorate uh, and a way of sidestepping questions on the government's actual performance. And I read all of this as a, as a sign of, uh, of there actually being a fight, uh, you know, up ahead. Thank you. Um, I must confess that um, I wasn't expecting this answer, and I am delighted that we now have a debate on our hands. Um, I say this because about two weeks ago, I did a Zoom conference with a number of uh, South Asians, mostly based in India, <clears throat> about India-Pakistan relations and where they might go depending on who becomes prime minister in India and who becomes prime minister in Pakistan. So the consensus on the other side was that Narendra Modi was going to win the election. And so that was a, something that was given. And what was happening in Pakistan, we didn't know <laughs> whether indeed the elections would be held or not, and let alone who will become prime minister. So that is why I asked this question as to whether this was a given. Is Narendra Modi going to win and there's no two ways about it or not? And now we have an answer here that seems to suggest that, you know, at the very least, the combined opposition is going to give him a run for his money. Now, uh, to, now to turn to you, do you agree with this assessment or do you think that there are other ifs and buts here? So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to agree with Siddharth's assessment. Um, and I think, you know, hope, hope is a wonderful thing. And I want, I want to have hope in this election. And so I really hope you're right. Um, I don't think I can fully agree with that, however, as, as just a sort of matter of observing from the outside. A foregone conclusion that Modi will win seems a bit strong to me. Um, nothing's ever a foregone conclusion. And I think that assuming that the BJP will definitely come back into power is probably the easiest way to ensure that outcome. Right? So, so I don't think we should do that. But I think as a matter of prediction, it is certainly more likely than not. Um, and so 
you know, when, when I think about the election, um, in large part what I'm thinking about is sort of what will happen likely thereafter, g given a, a sort of, you know, in favor of the BJP result. Thank you. Um, well, then we obviously come to the next question. If the odds are that Narendra Modi will win, however slim these, these odds may be, what can we expect from the BJP and Narendra Modi in the next five years in terms of where he is right now, where he is trying to take India, uh, and how far will he succeed in doing that, given that, as you suggest, there seems to be some resistance um, to the direction that he's taking India in? Uh, before I answer that question, I would say that actually uh, where your South Asian analysts may not have been wrong is that on the Indo-Pak front and perhaps distressingly on many other fronts, a change of regime or change of prime minister is actually not going to make all that much difference. Uh, and coming now to the question that you asked directly, if Modi comes back, where will he go? The fact is that a number of elements of policy have been put into place, many of which are now uh, either irreversible or uh, reversible under very, very difficult circumstances. For example, uh, Mr. Modi's Jammu Kashmir policy, now that it has received the imprimatur of the Supreme Court of India, uh, should logically be considered uh, irreversible. The uh, ratcheting up of disputes on religious lines, which is what the Babri Masjid, Ram Janabhumi fight was always about, uh, is going to proceed apace. And here I want to emphasize that even though India has a law passed in 1991, which says that there will be no reopening, the, the religious character of any place of worship as it existed on August the 15th, 1947, can henceforth no longer be changed. There is a law to that effect. And this law was passed in order to ensure that there would be no repetition of the Babri Masjid, Ram Janabhumi dispute when it came to other mosques that the Bharti Janta Party and the Sangh Parivar were already beginning to agitate about. And you could say that for uh, roughly 25, 30 years, that law held the field and those disputes all vanished. But thanks to the Supreme Court reinterpreting that law in a very peculiar fashion, these disputes have re-emerged. And uh, I would say that whether Mr. Modi comes or not, those disputes, if Mr. Modi doesn't come, the Bharti Janata Party will use those disputes as a means of uh, muddying the water and agitating against whichever government comes in. And if Mr. Modi does come back to power, uh, you will find those disputes also being pursued. So I think that the this, this religious... Uh, uh, r religious chauvinistic dimension of uh, Mr. Modi's policies uh, will take on a sharper focus. The, uh, I think that the kind of laws that have been drafted when it comes to controlling the flow of free flow of information, controlling telecoms, there's a draft uh, telecommunications bill, which now aims to, uh, to deal with OTT platforms and to subject them to the same level of uh, uh, kind of censorship as uh, other content. Uh, you have uh, laws and rules on the anvil that are aimed at uh, censoring content put out by digital news platforms. Uh, so I think all of this will carry on. And uh, of course, on the economic front, uh, if there is one thing which characterizes Mr. Modi's rule over the last nine years, it's been how business-friendly a government he's run. 
And I think even that will get accentuated, even if it comes at the cost of growing inequality, even if it comes at the cost of growing displacement. Uh, so I think that all of these elements uh, will carry on uh, you know, acquiring greater and greater salience, uh, in my view, if he does return to power. Uh, you know, so I, I don't see any, uh, any shift from the trajectory that he's taken. And on the foreign policy front and on the bilateral front, uh, I would say speci specifically with regard to Pakistan, since uh, we, are, we are discussing this here in Lahore, I don't think there, there is any shift possible uh, on the, uh, the India-Pakistan front, uh, you know, given the way in which the BJP has framed its entire uh, domestic politics. So that's my, uh, my reading of the tea leaves. Before I come to you, I need to <coughs> go back to you with a question <coughs> that comes out of what you've just said. <coughs> um, Narendra Modi's economic miracle, is it true that this the sheen has come off? Don't forget that that was the original factor that drove him to power, uh, his great performance uh, in his home state. Um, and his close relations with the Indian big business. I understand that India's growth rates are now declining under Narendra Modi, number one. Number two, that as you point out, the combined opposition is now making a comeback in some form or another. Therefore, are we to expect that sometime in the next term, even if Narendra Modi comes to power now, there may be a dent in his popularity going forward and that India could still halt this slide, what I call a slide um, into a, a Hindu majoritarianism. Is you, you seem to suggest that that's going to be very difficult. See, if he, if he comes back to power, then I think that, I mean, I think one thing that, that analysts need, need to Take very, I mean, you need to take what the BJP says very seriously. Uh, and the mistake people made in the past was that they never took it seriously. So in 98, his election manifesto, Mr. Vajpayee said, India's gonna go nuclear. And in India went nuclear. Uh, the BJP in 2014 and 2019 said, we want to get rid of Article 370, we want to do this, we want to do that. They are proceeding apace. Uh, so the, uh, and, and that's because there is a, you know, unlike, you know, people compare Modi sometimes to Trump or Erdogan or uh, Putin. The diff key difference is that those are individual leaders who have a certain following within whatever political apparatus exists there. But Mr. Modi is part of a hundred year old political slash social slash cultural organization called the RSS, which has its cadre, which has its agenda, and which has been working systematically in pursuit of a certain goal of where they want to take India. And I don't think uh, Mr. Modi is going to be swerved from that. He's a product of that. If, of course, he comes back, say, because you know there are different scenarios under which he could come back. Uh, Mr. Modi is hoping for 400 seats. But let's say he gets 250 or 260 and then is forced to form a coalition. Sure, uh, there would be some trimming of sales. But uh, on the question of the economy, I think the Indian economy is still perhaps the fastest growing economy, major economy in the world. Uh, there's been some, slow, some slowing down in terms of the growth rate, no decline. I mean, there's, there's a kind of instead of going at 7%, maybe it's 6.5 or 6 or 5.5. The major problem is that this growth is not getting translated into uh, shared wealth. So inequality is increasing. Even when growth happens, jobs are not being created. I was looking at the data uh, from, I think, the last couple of months, uh, huge cutbacks in the IT sector. Uh, many companies that were once celebrated as the future of the IT revolution are now laying off people. Uh, so there is a sense in which uh, job creation isn't keeping pace. And you're right. So what brought Mr. Modi to power in 2014 was 
his ability to connect with the aspiration of young people who said we want to you know we want a better future for ourselves we've had 10 years of manmohan now let's try something new they they bought into this media manufactured myth of a gujarat model and so on and so forth and then in 2019 i would say out of an innate sense of fairness uh, they said well sure demonetization was a disaster uh, the other handling hasn't been good but he needs 10 years even manmohan got two terms uh so one in the 2019 election one met a lot of people who were saying you know we need to give him a second chance uh so you know uh, but i think that in this election his his inability to deliver jobs his inability to deliver quality jobs uh is something that perhaps people are going to take into account uh so that sheen is wearing off somewhat but the business community still stands i think pretty rock solid behind him um <clears throat> please feel free to comment on what he said but my question to you also is that are we then fated or destined call it what you will uh, to see a permanent decline of the congress in india so okay let, let, let me answer this sort of combination of questions um let me begin by saying when when i think about a potential the potential course of india after the 2024 elections i begin from the standpoint that india is no longer a fully functioning democracy right and so that's important india is a hindu rashtra and that transformation happened essentially in 2019 with the, with those elections from my perspective i would point out that in terms of india no longer being a fully functioning democracy that's something that international observers have close to consensus on at this point so you look at the vidam research institute you look at freedom house they both downgraded india right one to partly free the other describes india as an electoral autocracy right so yes i think if the bjp wins in 2024 we will see an acceleration of their agenda um but but in a sense it's more of the same right if you're looking for the moment when historians 50 years from now will pinpoint when was india lost it is behind us at at this point going forward if the bjp wins i would expect to see some fireworks right and that's based on what happened after the 2019 elections in the year thereafter we saw the the revoking of kashmir semi autonomous status we saw the citizenship amendment act announced we saw the nrc announced we saw the brutal crushing of protests in response to that um we we saw the delhi riots of of 2020 2020 and and again the brutal response to that 53 dead hundreds injured i would expect to see some some sort of comparable set of of events happen right um and again i do agree with siddarth that if there is a coalition government perhaps perhaps we'll see a little a little bit of trimming back on on that front um i also agree with siddarth that we will we'll definitely see a sort of general continuation of kind of anti-muslim sentiment and a majoritarian agenda there more conversions of mosques into temples um One thing that I'll note there that's sort of interesting for Elise as a historian um with the Babri Masjid case something that came up repeatedly was the question of whether there used to be a temple there number 1 and number 2 if there was a temple there was it a Hindu temple or a Jain temple and what happened to it did it fall into disuse or did Babur's general who built the Babri Masjid did he actually have it destroyed Okay? And the answers to those questions mattered not legally particularly, um but they mattered to a lot of people in terms of thinking about the the sort of moral nature of what should be done about about the Babri Masjid and after it was destroyed the site going forward. In contrast, many of the sites that are being discussed now in India, many of the mosques, um right, you know, in in places like Mathura and in Banaras and Varanasi, um these are mosques that stand on temples that we know are destroyed. It's part of the historical record, right? So there the, the Kashi Vishwanath temple was destroyed in Banaras by the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb Alamgir and then there was a mosque built in its place. This is well documented. You can even see it in the mosque. They left one wall of the temple intact and just incorporated it into the mosque. Um and so when one thinks about, you know, will the mosque that is now standing there will it be destroyed and how quickly might that proceed? It's worth keeping in mind that this set of historical arguments that occupied people concerning the Babri Masjid 
does not exist for that mosque, right? It's clear there was a temple. It's clear that it was destroyed. Obvi and so then the only question that remains is what should we do about it now, right? And I think that post-2024 elections, India might be in a place where the answer is, is quite obvious to those who favor a Hindu majoritarian perspective. Um, I think w one other thing I want to say is concerns India's international behavior. Um, so we, we've talked a little bit about Indo-Pak relations. Um, but I think it's worth noting that India, the Indian government is increasingly acting in an erratic and fairly dangerous matter on a wider international stage. Many of you may be aware that the BJP stands credibly accused of having carried out an assassination of a Canadian national on Canadian soil this past summer, okay? This is something that extremely rogue states do and extremely rogue states alone do, right? This is behavior we would expect to see from Russia or Saudi Arabia or, or nations of that kind. So to see a nation that other people, not me, but other people still call the world's largest democracy, commit that kind of act is, is very shocking. Also this past summer, India's BJP government stands accused of having attempted to assassinate a United States citizen on US soil, right? And that was foiled by federal law enforcement and there is a case pending in the Southern District of New York, right? A federal law case on, on that issue. So if it goes to trial, we'll see what, what information comes out to all of us. As I said, these are very extreme actions um, and they put India's relationships on an international stage in a lot of jeopardy. Right, this is a moment where, especially in the US, my, my, my government is very much looking to expand our relations with India, right? We want friendly relations, we want more trade, th this sort of thing. And frankly, the American government is willing to overlook a lot of human rights violations within India, but they're probably not gonna be very willing to overlook the assassination of their own citizens on their own, in their own territory, right? That's, that's a violation of sovereignty. Um, and so I think that that's one thing that is a question hanging for me, right, is, is will the BJP be able or willing to pull back on some of that behavior or will they proceed on that? In which case I do not think that their international relations, at least with Western states, are, are going to go particularly well. Um, thank you. I'm glad you raised these issues because I was going to, to start talking and questioning some of these problems. My sense, and this is for you to comment on. My sense is that, you know, there has been a historical romance the West has had with India, beginning from the Nehru years onwards. And even during the BJP times, that romance has continued. The notion of a great civilization, the notion of a great secular civilization, democratic civilization. Now, the civilization part of it is very interesting, but no less interesting is the Demo demo democratic and the secular part. And you seem to suggest that that's taking a beating, especially in the Western mind. So which would make, what would that make of the Western romance um, with India? That's the first question. And the second question, of course, is that um, India is now entering into some very, very powerful alliances. Uh, unprecedented in the past, the notion of neutrality has been chucked out. And India is now firmly in the American camp. In, in, in so many ways, um, uh, especially in the Asia Pacific. Um, so for my question to you, Siddharth, is that to what extent will this slight alienation uh, of the Western community with India's human rights rec record and the issues that Audrey's pointed out, um, assassinations um, in, in Western countries of dissidents, Indian dissidents, and perhaps more because I have never, I mean, certainly not for, for the last X number of years, I had never seen any uh, coverage of uh, what was happening in Kashmir, the human rights violations in Kashmir. But now even major American newspapers uh, have, have picked that, that issue up. And so wherever there are violations of human rights in India, these are now being picked up by the West, Western press. So to what extent do you think uh, this slight change in Western opinion about what India is, to what extent do you think this might impact on the BJP's policies? Will there be a dogged resistance to say, to hell with you, we don't care, we are big, and we can do whatever we like, or do you think there might be a moderation in some of these issues? I think that Mr. Modi and his advisors are quite confident that uh, 
this notion of shared values occupies a very small, I mean, is, is only uh, fleetingly important when it comes to uh, the uh, strategic partnership between the United States and India. Uh, yes, it's part of the rhetoric. It's always been. Uh, but I don't think that uh, for the U.S., uh, you know, the fact that uh, there are violations of press freedom or human rights defenders are arrested or you have all kinds of fabricated cases, I, I don't think these are uh, game changers for them. Uh, Audrey's right that the allegation of Indian... Uh, of an Indian plot uh, against a U.S. national in New York is of a different order of magnitude. But even there, uh, one has to see uh, what kind of evidence the U.S. has and how far they are prepared to take this. Will they take it only so far as to extract concessions out of Mr. Modi? Or will they go the whole hog? Uh, frankly, we don't know. But it's very clear, given the emerging geopolitical situation, that for the US and its allies, India is an important state to have on its side. The Ukraine war, even though India has refused to condemn Russia's aggression against Ukraine, has, never, has ironically also added to India's heft uh, as, as somebody that you want on your side. Uh, because you don't want to push India further towards Russia or you think that India has leverage vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And the, uh, the positive aspect for Mr. Modi is that today uh, the U.S. wants to improve relations with India. Russia wants to improve relations with India. And I would say even the Chinese who actually are right now in occupation of Indian territory and nibbling away, and they've done this for the last three or four years. Even the Chinese now appear to be sending signals that they want to improve relations. The Chinese also don't want to push India too far into the American camp. My own two cents, uh, Najab, but I'm an outlier on this. Uh, you know, the conventional realists in India uh, all favor a very close alignment between India and the U.S., my sense is that uh, this is probably not going to happen. That there will be limits, uh, and very important limits, that, uh, that India will set, beyond which India will not, will not go. And, uh, you know, uh, perhaps good the, the, the state of the uh, bilateral relationship with the U.S. and India would be uh, determined by the extent to which the U.S. reads and understands what those limits are. Uh, if you were to ask me to be concrete, I would say uh, India will, you know, un is unlikely to take part in any U.S.-led military action against a third country. Uh, that would be a red line that I don't see India crossing in a hurry. Uh, but uh, you know, but, and, and there are probably other things too. So I think there are limits. I would say India is not. India is has gone the closest it has gone so far in, in uh, lining up with the U.S in the Asia-Pacific region, and this is uh, not a costless strategy because you're sending a certain signal to the Chinese that, that also needs the Chinese to act in a certain way that's not in your interest. But uh, I don't think that uh, India is a, uh, is, could be called an ally of the U.S., uh, a military ally in the same way as uh, traditional American allies, uh, Japan, ROK, and so on. Thank you. Um, I, I have two questions which I think would be of interest to uh, Pakistani audience. Um, so I'll just ask those two questions and then we'll try and open this uh, debate to the floor. Now, Siddharth seemed to suggest that there is no prospect. If Narendra Modi comes, returns to power, uh, there's no prospect at all of any thaw in India-Pakistan relations. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, I, I'm going to expand on that a little bit. Um, when he first came to power, the then Pakistani Prime Minister made a determined effort to open uh, or to, break, or to uh, um, start talks with, with India. This was against the wishes of the then Pakistani establishment. 
and um, Nawaz Sharif went to India to on his inauguration. But unfortunately, uh, the things didn't progress beyond that. After that, another attempt was made to restart a dialogue, uh, which is when Narendra Modi unexpectedly dropped in to attend a marriage in the Sharif family. And that too didn't take off because then there were some acts of uh, alleged terrorism uh, committed in India that were laid at the door of Pakistan. Um, now, a lot of water has flown under the bridge since then. But my sense is that, and this is something Nawaz Sharif has talked about, even in his uh, uh, interviews since he returned to Pakistan. Uh, he said that basically he, will ha he has two I big items on his agenda. One is to revive economic growth and the other is to see if, if relations with India can be improved. Um, trade relations and other relations. And my sense is that should he become prime minister, we don't know, but should he become prime minister, he will make an effort uh, in this direction. Uh, so I want to reiterate, uh, I want to again ask you to consider what might be Narendra Modi's response if after he's won the election and there's really, really no need to play to any Pakistan bogey, do you think there's still, uh, uh, you, you, would you like to stick to your view that Nawaz Sharif will not get any momentum or uh, make any gains in terms of even small offerings of opening up trade and perhaps people-to-people -people contacts? Forget about Kashmir, but the other, uh, the other issues. I mean, I would certainly hope so. Um, I think that, that that would be great. But I mean, I think the, the way you, you phrase it, right, that you don't have to talk about, if Modi wins, he doesn't have to talk about the Pakistan boogeyman anymore, right? Yes, but I think you're, you're underestimating the sort of the, the cultural power of Hindutva. Right, and, and this, this is where, I mean, Siddharth and I perhaps disagree on this. Um, I don't think Modi ever ran and won on his economic record, right? I think that that's very, I think that's wishful thinking, um, and it absolves a lot of Indian voters of their votes, but I think that he always has run and won on Hindutva, right? And, you know, the, the pogrom in Gujarat back in the early 2000s, I mean, that helped propel him to victory in 2014 on, on a national stage in India, right? That, that was a plus, not, not, a, not a defect. And so, you know, it, if, if Modi wins again, if the BJP comes back to power, it would be, practically speaking, very much in their interest to thaw relations with Pakistan for a lot of different reasons. It would be good for their economy. It would be excellent for trade. It would also be good internationally, right? It I mean, what, one thing that cripples India on an international stage is that they can't lead regionally, right? They talk about the Asia-Pacific region. I mean, they make up these regions, basically, to come up with an area that's kind of large enough and yet circumscribed in particular ways that they can lead in because they can't get along with their neighbors, right? They can't get along with Pakistan. Um, they're, you know, I mean, Modi in the last few days, he's been entrenched in this, you know, ridiculous spat with the Maldives Islands, right? I mean, this makes India look ridiculous right, from a Western perspective. And so, if Modi were able to sort of swallow the anti-Muslim sentiment and just sort of get on with it and semi-normalize relations with Pakistan, yes, it would make him a more powerful leader. But I don't think that he can do that because I think he's a true believer, right? There's no reason not to think that he's not truly in his heart of hearts, deeply interested in Hindu nationalism and Hindu supremacy. And I also think that he's part of a larger movement, right? I mean, Hindutva is fundamentally driven by anti-Muslim hate. That, that is the core of what it is, right? It's a, it's a form of fascism. And it's, you can't, if you're, if you're a fascist leader, you can't just come to power and then forget everything that got you there and just actually govern well. That never happens. Rajiv, can I just yeah. leap in on the India yeah. Park thing? I think the way that you framed it is, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a, it's, it requires a considered answer. And I would say that a lot depends on how Mr. Nawaz Sharif uh, approaches the relationship. To be more specific, and I want to say this in uh, as blunt a manner as I can. As far as Mr. Modi and the BJP are concerned, Jammu Kashmir discussions are completely off the table. A government led by Mr. Modi will never agree to discuss in any shape or form the question of JNK. So the old 
bilateral structure, right? Composite dialogue or whatever its different avatars were. Uh, that is over. And uh, the only discussion will be those parts of Pakistan, those parts of the former princely state that are still in, uh, inside uh, on the Pakistani line, uh, Pakistani side of the LOC, uh, how are they going to come back to India? That's the discussion. If a future government of Pakistan is willing to say, is willing to be pragmatic and accept that on JNK there can be no headway right now. Can we move the envelope on trade? Can we move the envelope on investment? Can we move the envelope on sports? Uh, there's a reasonable chance that they will find some positive uh, acceptance because there is, a, there is a strong business constituency in India. So Audrey's right, Hindutva has its approach. But think of Mr. Modi as, he, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, the brain is sort of Hindutva, but the sinews, uh, I mean, the, the, all the money power is coming from business. And the business guys can think of a situation where they would very much like to uh, have more trade, more investment with Pakistan and a, a wider economic area. So, but, but that cannot come, if it comes bundled with uh, anything which even remotely suggests that Mr. Modi is walking back on what on the steps he's taken on JNK, then that's a non-starter. So if, if Nawaz Sharif or a future PM is willing to, uh, to say, and I know in the past, prime ministers have taken this view, that let's set aside contentious issues and move ahead on what we can, then it's possible things could move. Okay, um, I'd like to just make my own comment on this issue of India-Pakistan. And I'd like to remind you how the debate on India-Pakistan has progressed. In 1997, I think it was, uh, when talks were being held between Pakistan and India, Nawaz Sharif over here and I.K. Gujral over there, uh, 66, 1966, 67, I think, um, the, the, the two sides came very close um, to moving forward uh, without necessarily talking about the core issue first. Uh, you know, the issue that then happened at Agra when we said the core issue is Kashmir and suddenly the Indians turned around and said the core issue is terrorism for us. And so the talks broke down. Now. What has happened subsequently is that one of the reasons why Nawaz Sharif lost favor with the Pakistani establishment in his last term was that he wanted to move ahead with some of the issues that you talk about without necessarily, without necessarily clutching at Kashmir as a core issue. In other words, we only talk about Kashmir. Once we resolve it, we talk about everything else. That was not his position. He was angling for trade. And he was angling for a slight normalization of relations, pending the re resolution of disputes. And then Pathan Court happened, I think, and that was derailed. Now, move forward. Just before Imran Khan was ousted or lost his majority, call it what you will, he was advised by the Pakistani establishment to open trade with India. And as he was himself the commerce minister at that time, and he asked, Hamad Azhar, who was then the advisor on these things, to move, of, move the file for the opening of trade, a certain limited amount of trade in certain issues. And he'd got the green light from the establishment to do this. But then in a cabinet meeting, this decision to open trade was reversed because it was felt that in the event that the PTI regime lost office, this would go down badly because then the opposition could take advantage of it and say, You've been abusing and, and, and screaming and shouting murder at Narendra Modi, and now you've gone back on your word. Because let's not forget, after, 2000, after nine, 2019, when Kashmir was reincorporated back into the Indian constitution in a different way, uh, it was Pakistan that cut off trade. Uh, and so now to restore trade would not have been any big concession. Um, but Imran Khan balked at it. He decided not to go ahead. Literally at the last minute. 
Now, the point I'm trying to make is this, that there have been yeah. discussions in our, on our side. Uh, and even that discussion continues to this day about whether we can take some unilateral steps yeah. to normalize the behavior, yeah. not to resolve core outstanding disputes, but to normalize relations. Now, this is some uh, the word that is now being bandied about. So my question again, I throw this to you, back again to you, that, you know, normalization means a little bit of easing of the visa regime, uh, opening up of trade, even books are not allowed to be imported from India now, whereas a lot of the textbooks that India produces are uh, desperately needed over here. Forget about politics and all the rest of it, the scienti scientific and technical stuff that India produces is needed over here, as well as agricultural research inputs and so on and so forth. And then, of course, there are those short-term measures that uh, will help uh, facilitate trade, uh, which is, you know, there are shortages on either side of the border, which can be easily overcome by a quick uh, restoration of trade, uh, certainly. So, and therefore, and of course, sporting content, uh, contests. We have the Champions Trophy coming up um, in a year's time, and it's a, Pakistan is supposed to be the host. And India's position, or the BCCI's position so far has been that we don't have government permission to come and play. But let me just remind you that this was the position earlier also when the Asia Cup was uh, supposed to have been played in Pakistan. And I personally know how difficult it was to get the Indian side to agree to at least play some of the, allow the uh, part of the Asia Cup to be played over here because I negotiated with them. Yeah. But I got the feeling distinctly that the BCCI took permission from the Indian government to allow this to happen and stuck to their position now the P cricket board has just signed an agreement with the, uh, the uh, ICC and the agreement says that the, Ish, the, the Champions Trophy will be held okay. in Pakistan. Now, I don't think the ICC has got any clearance from the BCCI, but there will be penalties if BCCI refuses to play uh, in Pakistan. So I think it's entirely conceivable that small steps towards normalization can take place with Pakistan, uh, if Nawaz Sharif is Prime Minister, regardless of whether Narendra Modi is there or somebody else is there, because I think the, uh, the, the demonstration effect of that in terms of the issues that uh, Audrey has raised, uh, India is supposed to you know, have terrible relations in the region. How can it aspire to great power status if, if its own region is, is in turmoil and they don't accept its hegemony and so on and so forth. So. Um, that was, you know, my take on some of these issues. If you'd like to comment, fine. Otherwise, I'll open uh, the, uh, the debate to the floor. Yeah, no, I think I, I agree with you. And I, I just will add one more thing, because this is also an, an important element, not just, for Navarsh, uh, not just for Narendra Modi, but any future Indian leader, which is the, the sanctity of the assurance that the government of Pakistan gave to the government of India in January 2004. I think this was President Musharraf and Prime Minister Vajpayee, that the uh, territory under the control of the government of Pakistan will not be used, uh, that the government of Pakistan will not allow territory under its control to be used for uh, anti-India activities. Uh, this is something that uh, every government in India will, will want to hold Pakistan to. And I think that uh, if Pakistan abides by that commitment, which is its, its, its stated commitment, and if, uh, as I said, uh, ways are found on, on trade, sports, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, it's possible that this, el this element can be moved ahead. And you know, when I said JNK can't be spoken about uh, in the same way, uh, it's not, uh, I, I mean, I'm not, it doesn't really change things on the ground. Because if the, uh, uh, Manmohan, uh, you know, Tariq Aziz or Musharraf, Musharraf formula was considered the high water mark where India and Pakistan hold on to those parts of JNK which are under their control and find ways to uh, improve uh, connectivity. And that's, the pieces of that could well be picked up in the future as long as there is no, uh, you know, no discussion on uh, I mean, Pakistan should not expect that India will entertain a discussion on what happened in India in August 2019. That's simply not going to happen. Would you like to say anything? 
Um, I think I'll just briefly comment that when I, I hope I hope you both are right and, and that I'm wrong on this issue. Um, but that you know you said 2004, Siddharth. I mean, I think what counted as anti-India back then was a little different <laughs> than what counts as anti-India now. Like um, my living and breathing appears to be anti-India in the eyes of the BJP. So no, I think, I, that, I think, I think that, that's that a hard those organizations, the military organizations. Um, <coughs> just want to comment and on what you said, but then we'll move on. Yes, it's true that um, uh, there was a Pakistani hand that the Indians referred to about events in Kashmir, um, which derailed the talks. But I think you will admit, uh, Siddharth, that in the last two or three years, there hasn't been any Indian complaint of any Pakistani hand um, in Kashmir or anywhere else in India. The Pakistani establishment, it seems to me, has gone out of its way to make sure that that allegation no longer rings true. However, I need to point out uh, for my Indian friends that the boot is now on the other foot. The Pakistani establishment and media are accusing India's national security apparatus of fomenting trouble um, uh, in Pakistan. I don't want to go into any details. So I think if, the, if some of these issues are discussed at some level, um, there will have to be a quid pro quo. The Doval doctrine is not a secret doctrine. He's openly talked about his attempt to defend India by aggressive moves, moves uh, of which the strategic strikes, so-called, were an ele element, and now perhaps uh, s uh, support to various uh, people based in Afghanistan for fomenting trouble uh, in Pakistan. But so I think, yeah, it's a thorny road, uh, but I think, uh, the, the, the paradigm has slightly changed. And if there is an attempt by Pakistan to try and normalize, um, uh, it will require some give also uh, by India. But having said that, I'm hoping that both sides will give and that there will be a normalization, at least people to people contacts uh, should be restored um, and we should stop fomenting trouble in each other's country. I lost my mic. <laughs> There's an enormous amount of hubris in India because of its success, not just the economy, but also in space, the moon shot, the Mars shot, and so forth. Now, this is touted as a BJP success, but uh, to my mind, this is a success of the old Nehru uh, uh, way of thinking of uh, uh, having science and technology as the way forward for India. My first question is, would you agree on this? I, my question is to both of you. My second question is, assuming that uh, it's Congress which comes to power rather than the BJP, in terms of how India looks at itself with respect to its neighborhood, by neighborhood I mean not just Pakistan, but Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, so forth, and perhaps even beyond that towards Africa. Africa, I say, because of the blue water navy it's made, the nuclear submarines and so forth. Is there a difference in worldview between the Congress and BJP when it comes to visualizing India's role in the world on the larger scale? So these two questions to both of you. Uh, sh should I go first? Uh, great questions. Uh, you know, in India, it's, it's, it's a joke uh, that every, uh, every achievement today, uh, particularly in space, uh, which clearly has a, 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 a long lineage, right, uh, is all due to... Uh, the current government and the current prime minister and of course many of them also run down Nehru. But I think the wider public understands that these are accomplishments that have come because of systematic investment by successive governments, which includes Congress, BJP, Janta Dal, everybody who all paid attention particularly to the space. So which is why India 
which you know pakistan's suparco back in the 59 or 60 61 as old but i think the systematic support that india's space venture got from successive governments is what has 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 enabled india to do what it's doing today and uh, your the second part of your question uh i would say regrettably that there is uh, you know when it comes to uh, attitude towards neighbors uh i've seen statements in the past when the congress was prime minister was running the government and had behaved uh, shall we say in a big brotherly fashion towards nepal or uh, one of the neighboring countries bjp would criticize them and and now the now the you have the congress criticizing the bjp for some of its foreign policy actions but when it comes to those them actually being in power uh, frankly there's a great there's a much higher degree of continuity uh on the foreign policy front i think mr modi has taken things to a much higher degree say the india us uh, uh but the you know tr- friendship or partnership but the trajectory was set by the congress and he is simply you know going further and further so i don't i you know if if there is a change of government i don't see that you know i think that uh the relations with the neighbors and with africa the indo pacific uh will probably not change by all that much Yeah so I'll just briefly comment I I agree on India space agency being a sort of multi-decade process um that said the space agency has come a long way from the days of Aryabhatta which is the first satellite that India launched into space named after a first millennium CE Sanskrit intellectual um and so yes I think I think it's a, an accomplishment we're celebrating um but but for, from a longer duree perspective internationally I also agree I think that there there's a great degree of continuity one difference that i would point out or a potential difference anyways um is that arguably modi is more susceptible to foreign influence than congress leaders have been historically um and so one way one very potent way we're seeing that play out right now is in india's sort of position uh such as it is on the gaza conflict right between you know regarding israel and hamas um and i mean as as many of you will know india is a long standing supporter of palestinian human rights but no more right india's lined up behind israel and there's various reasons for that including a historical connection and sort of parallelism between zionism and hindutva but i think one can also see a strong us influence there right in terms of thinking about what the united states government wants india to do vis-a-vis the gaza conflict it is definitely support israel which is what they are more or less doing uh i would like to ask a question how dangerous religious fanaticism or religious extremism or uh, hindutva what we call it is going to be uh, for india and its uh, neighboring countries because we listen to the uh, slogans of uh, akhand bharat and things like that uh, i mean what is the future of that the future of akhand bharat um I mean so the akhand part this sort of like united india vision i mean unless india is going to invade all of its neighbors that is going to remain a theory not in practice i don't think india is actually going to invade nepal i think they're just going to continue arguing with them in a pithy way over maps right that being a controversy in the last year um I will say in terms of the Bharat part um that's interesting. India made some some noise last year about potentially changing its name, right? And de-recognizing as India and adopting the name of Bharat. Most people thought this was a terrible idea. Um I this is one of my more contrarian views. I actually think it's not such a terrible idea. Um for a couple of reasons. One is that given the historical break of the modern nation of india with its modern history of democracy i think it's not terrible to have a name change that would be nice actually for historians going forward um also if india ever formally derecognizes as such and adopts the name of bharat pakistan could recognize as india right and thereby claim its larger exactly. history <laughs> we could we could lay claims to a lot of our history <laughs> I think we'll have one last question because Audrey has to go to another second isn't that right yeah okay ji okay um I, I mean I I I agree with Siddharth on Pakistan's economic relations with India it's really up to Pakistan if we are consistent that 
Economics is what will drive us. Our policy, I think our relations with India will improve because of the business community, et cetera. But my question really is to Audrey. Uh, I know how difficult it is to take on the Indian diaspora in the United States, and you have, and, and hats off to you. My question is, has India changed so much that if you were to go and give a talk on your book on Aurangzeb today, and the Congress party were in power, it, you would get the same treatment as you did? I, I mean, th there's a lot of ifs in that question. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm currently not planning any travel to India. Um, the last time when I was in India was in January of 2019, and I did talk about my Aurangzeb book then, and we faced security problems even then. Um, do I think that those would evaporate in the event of a regime change? No, but I think it would improve a lot. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Audrey has to rush off to another session. I think that's going to be even more interesting than this. A new history of